start that right now. Uh, we are thrilled to have Jim here as we uh, have another great, uh, great presentation here. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping uh, things to go over. Uh, continuing education credits will be offered for this session. So just to make sure we, we have you down and uh, we're, we, we got you confirmed, if you can put your first and last name and whether you're USPTA or PTR certified in the chat, that'll help us make sure that we get, um, get, you, get you covered there with your CE credits. Um, if you do have any issues with this or need to follow up, shoot me an email. You should, be a bit, you should have been receiving uh, several from me throughout the, uh, throughout the tennis conference. So just let me know if there's any questions or any concerns, uh, if you have anything as far as that goes. Um, if you do have any questions uh, as we move through the session, we will be answering them uh, at the end. So if you can please put them in the Q&A box, we will get to them at the end of the session here. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can um, and we can follow up with you afterwards if, uh, if we don't get to any, any questions. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Jim Harp, who is the owner and director of tennis at uh, Harp Tennis Academy in Cumming, Georgia. So Jim, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome and take it away. Awesome, thanks Evan. And, and thank you everybody for, for tuning in here to, uh, to our chat. Hopefully um, this presentation will go well. It's not something I do a lot of in terms of Zoom calls and uh, trying, to, trying to get this put together correctly and, and make it make sense, gone over it a number of times. Thank you to USTA and big thanks to PTR and, and all the USPTA coaches that are out there. Um, you know, the competitive experience is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, it, it, having been a club professional, a tennis director, a staff professional, and, and the person cleaning out the, the water bins and, and everything in between, um, competition kept drawing me back. And, and it's something that, you know, I think about every day here. Um, in the 16 years that I've had heart performance tennis here in, in the Atlanta area, I, I think I've probably redesign uh, the program every single year and on a daily basis um, we'll probably reach out to somebody uh, whether it's a staff member or a friend or, or, or another coach or a player and, and and try to bounce off if we're doing the job we should be doing here so a, a level look at a lot of different programs a lot of wonderful coaches in the business um, that have helped build my personal philosophy on, on coaching um, in the competitive environment. Uh, so, you know, like anything, everything we've done has been built on the shoulders of others and, and super grateful to, to everybody. And, and again, thanks for, for tuning in. So with that, the competitive experience, and uh, we'll get started. Um, we are not moving forward here. There we go. All right. Try the, yeah, the air, using the arrows should, should, should bring it through, Jim. Yeah, I was doing it then and it didn't work, but I think it was me clicking on the, um, on the actual screen. So All right. the goal in, in competitive tennis, the competitive experience is um, that it has to be based on the competitive level that, that each person is, is playing or the developmental level uh, that they're playing. And um, it's really important to have a goal and to, to set goals and, and, the types of goals we set here on a daily basis, yearly basis, or multi-year um, changes based on the, the level of the players we have or the types of players we have. We were actually very, very strong in, in female players for a long time, uh, and then it shifted, and we've gone back and forth a few times. But we have shifted, and we have a lot of males right now. So, so there's a lot of things there that are changing. We have a lot of young ladies coming up, and we have plenty of young ladies in the program as well. But, you know, understanding the developmental level of, of each and every player is – critical to, to designing the program, to, to developing a curriculum, um, to understanding what we're trying to help each player get to. So it's quite personal. Uh, and in, inside of that, you know, however many players that we're working with at a given time. So in the competitive experience, very important to understand those. Here's a very good college player, one of the best players in the country, um, does some work with us here. Um, let's see if that'll play. There she goes. And he is working out with uh, one of our other players, uh, plays at South Carolina. This is actually a little SEC uh, competition, a UGA player and, and a South Carolina player training with us over the summer. Uh, it's Trent Bride and Jake Beasley. He's one of our young ones. Um, this is an 11-year-old girl. Uh, obviously, lots of different things going on here as we're working through a variety of um, different competencies with her and understanding her as a person. And... Uh, you could see all, all the different challenges we face with that level. Here's two of our professionals, retired touring professional, Jordan Cox, got to about 450 in the world. Austin Smith was 
somewhere in the 700s, I think, when he retired. Just came off tour with Bethany Maddox Sands. Just a huge body type difference when we look at the three. Um, even our college player, not, not quite as strong and, and as fit as these guys. So the bottom line was we have a lot of different levels, and we have to take those levels into consideration every minute of every day, and especially when we're planning. Years ago, I had a coach who's now the assistant coach at, um, at Kansas, and he came in, started working with us, and he said, Jim, what is your mission statement? And I was like, wow, I don't really have a mission statement, do I? So I went in and, and thought about it for a number of days, and, and this is what I wrote. Um, a mission is to provide an athletic environment grounded in character development that allows each player to seek their potential through the lessons of competition and training that embody the athletic spirit to succeed. And after him encouraging me to do that, it really became our philosophy. So along with setting our goals, it was very important that we had to have a philosophy, and, and not just about us, but when I've, I've collaborated with other coaches who run academies or own academies or are associated with co competitive based, um, competitive experienced programming, they have a mission, they have a character. It's, it's quite obvious that there is a certain character that runs through it. And I think it starts with that original mission statement. And, and then from there you move forward. Planning. Um, this is the how and the what, you know, so, so how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to put it in a structure. We've got to set goals, as we said. Um, you're going to set mission. What is, what is the mission? What's a philosophy, really, right? Um, the expectations of the program, the assessments that we're going to do on the players. We're going to understand our levels. We're going to create plans, and we're going to have a staff that can support the structure. Um, the curriculum, that's the fun stuff. The skills, um, the technical skills, the tactical skills, physical, mental, life skills. Something that we all go over all the time, I think, as coaches in and out of all of our continuing education pieces that we've got a lot of knowledge. And when that knowledge is put inside of a structure, uh, that structure becomes the gateway to giving that uh, knowledge out to our players. And for us also, especially me, staying on task, staying understanding what I'm trying to get through in a given day, a given week, a given month, a year, uh, with a single player, with multiple players, um, Without a structure for me personally, it would be, uh, what do I want to do today? And I've seen that break down for us a number of times. I've seen it break down for other players and coaches as well. And it, it helps the family. So, so the planning part was a big part of, you know, the story I'll kind of tell as we move forward. Um, the competitive experience, of, I believe that the program should have a certain energy when you walk in the, in the door, you know, when the parents, the families come in. We want the players to see and, and have it look and feel different. Um, again, a competitive experience, it means winning and losing. You're competing. So learning to win and learning to lose. Um, as we've all seen in numerous continuing ed situations, you know, we're preparing the athlete and the parents for the road. And then we're training to train to really learn how to train. And then uh, we're training uh, to eventually win, to compete and to win. And you know, but we can't get ahead of those pieces. Um, there is a different approach in junior development, I've found, than it is for college and professional. Um, it's still competitive, it's still winning and losing. At the junior level, we'll talk a, a lot about um, our curriculum and, and how we set it. Our curriculum is different for our college players, and, and if we have some touring professionals are coming in and out of town, certainly quite different there too. But there are different approaches, and there's so many similarities. Um, we all, I always try to stay very fundamentally based, you know, uh, keeping things simple uh, usually helps me keep things fundamentally based and, and our staff is really good at keeping me there. Um, I, I thought I was overthinking something the other day and I, and I put it out to the coaches and some thought I was and some thought I wasn't. So at that time, it didn't really help me. But, um, you know, you're trying hard every day. It should be based in, 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 in that fundamental grassroots approach to development. And then finally, I think it's really important, the players and the coaches and the parents have to be bought in. We, we have to have the right culture on the property or um, one bad apple, as they say, it, it'll mess it up. And it's not even a bad apple. It's just maybe they, they see it differently and need to find a different experience. But for us, the competitive experience and for each program that has a competitive experience, um, I think it should have form and it should have character. Um, experience, here's, here's a couple of fun picks. I, I threw these in because I was like, gosh, that's a lot of words, coach, as one of my players used to say to me. Um, our guy on the left decided that he did not think 
he should be playing the back draws. He didn't want to play back draws. So I agreed with him and said he was far better suited to doing some labor and how much I needed him to help me remove a lot of clay. Uh, and it was wet and heavy. And, and at the end of that, he, he agreed that he did a good job of removing the clay, but possibly he should play some more back draws. Um, one of our players at the end of a session, it was a very physical session. He's actually coming off of a strength and conditioning session where our strength and conditioning coach used um, a little racket, a little bit of running and hitting as well. And he was, he's as gassed as he looks in this picture and covered in clay and sweat. So, you know, again, the experience, what, what is it that's personal to you? Where's the mission? Where are the goals? What's the character? What's the form? Expectations. Um, winning and losing again. Uh, I'm big on the expectations because when the expectations are set, Everybody kind of knows what's going on. We all want to know what's happening. What, what should we expect? The long term, you know, we talk a lot about long term. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. You got to be careful talking too much about long term expectations. But am I trying to play high school tennis? Um, am I trying to play college tennis? Am I trying to play ITF level? Am I transitioning to the, the transition tour, the pro tour? Um, Expectations, and this is, I think, is very important. It's very important for parents, very important for coaches and, and, and uh, players. What, the box checking, meaning the developmental timelines for being coordinated, for uh, speed, for strength, where are the developmental windows? What boxes are we checking? When is my 11 year old serve going to be any good? Um, and we've certainly, everybody who's coached in, in any level of performance, low or high, has had that question. Why can't they serve? Well, there's a lot of reasons sometimes. Um, who? Who has expectations? The coaches have expectations. Parents have uh, expectations. The players have expectations. When we set the roles, I believe we really help those expectations a lot. And, and we define them. And, and we write them down. It would be fantastic. We do it here. I hope you do it. Um, and what are the goals for each of those? You know, as, as having roles and having goals knowing who expects what and what's expected is going to make a big difference. So the what, when, and who. Uh, different expectations. Um, uh, the, the colleges, universities, maybe you're living training at an IMG or, 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 you know, one of the other resorts around the country, academies uh, around the country. Um, parents may have different expectations. The kids may have different expectations, but we, we need to get close to understanding them. And again, you know, somebody going off to college for the first time coming from a junior program or very little programming, there's going to be some different expectations at the collegiate level uh, as there would be for a high school team or even uh, somebody beginning and, and playing in a, um, a league, a weekend league, a USTA, you know, starter league. Does it change expectations? So it's things we have to keep, you know, keep in mind. The expectations change. And I kind of glossed over that a little bit then. Um, one of the big ones that I'll cover a little bit in this is um, moving up players who start out at a retention recreational program, having a lot of fun um, jumping from an hour or twice a week could be moving up and into a two or three hour program with strength and conditioning um, and how they deal with those expectations. The parents' expectations may change them. They're like, wow, well, we expect to win a lot now. Is that fair? Is that right? So understanding those, um, where the, where are expectations at? Practice, competition, home life, relationships, you know, really everywhere. Everybody's going to have them and they're everywhere. And then the transitions again, back to that, which is you're going from sixth grade to seventh grade. You're going from eighth grade to high school. You're going from high school to college or beyond. So I believe clearly defined what is expected at each level. When there are increases in volume, intensity, and load, you got to be really careful about injury and illness. That's a big concern of ours, and I've seen it happen many times. Um, if you add the pressure of school and travel or more, that, then the risk increases. Um, prior to college, you're expected to learn, progress, and develop. In college, you're expected to develop and your potential and win, and professionally have to win. So lots of expectations. Big slide there. Lots of rabbit holes, too, by the way. So um, Trent were sort of working with us. Um, he's on the left, left picture with Grigor and Andre. Trent was playing at UGA, didn't have a great first year there, was frustrated, former world-class junior player, top 10 in the world. And he dropped in because I had one of my other guys uh, here training from South Carolina. I saw the video earlier. And Trent and Jake were uh, working out with us in the summer and Trent qualified into the qualies for a 250 for bb &T. And that morning he got a call from Grigor, the, uh, the morning before the quali actually, we were down there practicing to practice with them. 
Boy, the expectations sure changed at that point. And the second picture is strength and conditioning coach Ted Bordering, one of the best in the country, I believe. He's, he's here with us. He's a great guy. That's Trent. And in the back is Trent's primary coach. So in, in terms of expectations, um, I was a I was a collaborative coach. I was bringing something else in there. But Will Wright, again, one of the best coaches in the country, is, has been his primary coach since he's a very young man. He's done an exceptional job with him. So my expectations, Trent's expectations, strength and conditioning, primary coach, lots of moving parts there. And um, boy, it was, a, it was really fun and, and he played really great. Um, so moving along from expectations, your content of the sessions. So you're, you're in a competitive experience and you want to set the players up to develop. Now, when we talk about retention in, in tennis, it's extremely important that we, we plan and program. When we plan and program, we're going to be able to deliver a better, higher quality, enriched educational level for tennis players that's fun, and it's going to keep them in the game. When we don't teach it well, when we don't do a good job, then the players maybe don't come out as well. They don't play as well. And that, that's going to have them quitting at early teens, at least anecdotally, that's what I've seen. So we need a good pre-session. We need a good daily curriculum. Finishing a session athletic ethos and lifestyle. When they get here, they got to be ready for pre-practice. We have skill acquisition training that goes on during our main programming. When they finish, really great rehab and cool down, and they got to have the right lifestyle. Um, bottom line is within every session, these are the things that we need to make sure are there. Um, again, at the collegiate level, players may not have come from a well-designed program, may not have worked with a, uh, an organized program. So they're, they're going to have an adjustment. So the session content's very important. We're going to move forward and, and get more specific with that in a moment. Daily curriculum. Years ago, I looked at college and grade school and other people that had curriculums and different types of curriculums. And I said, gosh, it'd be nice if we could come up with a curriculum. What's fundamental? Um, what's specific to the levels? Could we do a, a model? I came up with an eight-week model. I'll show it to you here in a minute. I mean, all of our coaches are great around the country. There's so many wonderful people out there. I know you have all the ideas. Hopefully this will add some more ideas. Maybe you'll change it. If you come up with something great, please send it to me. You know, we love to use it here. I'm always trying to make this better. The skills we're teaching try to fall under the competencies of technical, tactical, physical, and mental. I have to add life skills in there because I think lifestyle is a big contributor to the success in the competitive experience. Um, Key elements for each age are going to be big for the growth, maturation, and development. We really need to understand how we're fitting that in or how we're fitting our players into that so that we're, we're teaching the right things at the right time. Um, college is going to have a different consideration for sure. Uh, but still, how do you want, do you want to have a curriculum? Do you want to set it up ahead of time? It may change more often there. Um, we're certainly checking more boxes at the junior level. We have a lot of things we really need to get through. And at the next level, a little bit less. And at the next level, a little bit less, maybe different uh, for both as well. And again, considerations, you know, um, kindergartner is way different than an 11-year-old. Uh, freshman in college way different than a senior. We are limited as coaches. However, with a curriculum and we have squad and individual needs, you know, we prepare ourselves. I think, I think it's a better way. I still haven't found the perfect way, but you're certainly trying. Our eight-week model, this is something that came about from a lot, of, a lot of continuing education, a lot of listening to great coaches, and trying to put together something that made sense that I could go to, that I could, again, keep myself on task with so that I wouldn't drift away. Because any good idea will send me, you know, thinking into the stratosphere forever. Um, this is ours. We have, a, we have an emphasis. We have numerous emphasis. Uh, uh, in an eight week period. So in a school age player, they have about five, eight week windows before the summertime. So the, the summer can be an additional one. In that are your, ta are your competencies, again, technical, tactical, mental, and physical. Again, include life in there too. Um, so August, September, this is an example. We could be working on forehand and backhand technique, kinetic chain, contact point, uh, rear leg following through, I mean, you name it, anything you'd like, uh, left, lefts, right, rights, tactical, um, pattern development fundamentals. I'm a big believer in, in understanding why a cross court, cross court or a cross court down the line, um, 
serve and volley. It could be um, dictating left of center with your forehand. So setting, setting a developmental base is going to give you a better opportunity to develop those patterns. Mental, um, proing up, something that I said accidentally to a player who was struggling one day, had a lot of negative outward self-talk. He was talking in circles around things, and I just said pro up. You need to really pro up because he's a good player. He's not professional, um, but he's, he's heading to a good college. And I just thought it was, it was a bad way of using his day. It was poor use of time. I was like, you really need to become more professional. Now, you know, at the USTA, we've talked about resilience. We've had a word. Um, there's been a lot of different things, professional, be this, be that. That was one. You get to pick those, though. This is where the, the art of coaching is, is, on, is on all of us figure out what you want to work on it's physically we got a great strength and conditioning coach could be working on single leg stability especially maybe we're moving wide into one of those developments so we're working on some defense and the single leg stability would be critical or, or we're working with a younger group of players um young ladies in the middle of puberty growing like crazy uh that's a big one really struggle to stop in those corners so again that's the fun part that's the fun part of coaching i think is gosh what can i fit inside this box don't do too much don't do too little Anyway, so that would be an eight-week emphasis of our, of our four competencies, and then we would um, move into October, November with a different one. In, that, in those uh, models, I'll often change up, and we'll have some competition days, kind of test it, see, are we, are we doing the things? Are we, did, we, did, we, did they hear it? Do they like it? Um, yeah, and summer's up to you, how you want to use summer. There's a lot of big tournaments in the summertime, too. Um, could be some peaks, could be some um, league travel there as well. So it's, it's not as um, solid of an eight weeks as the school year. So the, the model was really based on the school age child. Um, the national level ones, yeah, they're your winner in summer. But that, you might be working with league players who are trying to play really good. Um, and, and this is all part of a periodization model. And the periodization model for us here is to target – the winter nats and the summer nats schedule. And we do have players who are peaking at different times in there too. So, but overall, everybody's learning something fundamental. So it can all, it can all kind of fit in the same bottle. Um, let's factor in recovery and tournament schedule in school. A lot of stresses here. Recovery is huge. Uh, you're, we're all excited to teach. We're all excited to train. We're all excited to play and compete. If we don't recover, we're, we're going to burn them up and uh, back to illness and injury, right? Um, so I hope that's helpful. This is something we keep trying to, to make better and maybe somebody out there will make it better for me and I can steal it. It'd be wonderful. Uh, finally, um, in an eight week curriculum model and this approach, we can use specific um, written material or videos to support this curriculum, which is something I hadn't, was not able to do prior to this or, or didn't do well, didn't do consistently. So moving forward from there, the skills. This is our first big rabbit hole. Um, in rabbit hole, I mean, it gets so exciting to teach this stuff. Technical, we got to be careful. I think everybody would, I hope everybody would agree. In the past, we may have overcoached technical skill, um, especially closed style technical skill development. Um, it's been poorly coached often as well. It's been beautifully coached a lot as well. But a lot of overcoaching, a lot of poor coaching, a lot of poor technique. Um, the, you know, but we are teaching kinetic chain. We're teaching agility, balance, coordination, strength, speed, and at some point power use. Um, things factor heavily into your technical development. And we're going to get into these a little bit more as we go forward. I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on time, not go too fast or too slow. Tactically, game styles, fundamental pattern development, decision making. Um, and I'd say the decision making part's often undercoached. We tend to tell everybody how to play. And we need to allow them to discover that. Sending and receiving skills, probably under coach. Big opportunity at a young age. You may see later on that some of these skills that you're working with a young college player is you've got a lot of talent. And some of these skills might not be in place because the skill acquisition windows maybe didn't get hit in time. Um, so you may have to revisit some of that. So it's good to have a good background yourself in, in growth development and maturation. I think it's really critical. Um, Physicality, the body type, you know, ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph, things like that are helpful. Um, the growth, uh, assets, deficiencies, back to agility, balance, coordination, strength, speed, and power. Assessments, big on assessing, understand, you know, who, we're, who we have, 
how we're going to teach it, what we're going to teach, what can they understand. What I didn't put in here was cognitive too. Um, on the mental side, the, the cognitive ability of a player at different ages allows them to learn um, different things and to learn more than one thing at a time, of course. Um, I do think making it enjoyable, making it fun. I, I don't, I've never seen a great program where players weren't having fun. Maybe not all the time and every day, but it's got to underpin everything, in, in my opinion. Um, let's understand the role of competition and the rankings and assessments. I think that's going to be big, and it'll take some of the mental pressure off or at least add clarity to why I'm feeling various pressures as a player. And, and I don't care. Once they start to compete, they're, they're going to have some pressure, and parents are going to get involved and other factors, peer group. So these are the skills, and, and we'll get into them more in a minute. Um, I, I wrote competition as a tool for development. Its true role is as a platform for learning and practicing skills. Knowing this is a life skill. The attitude exists at the highest levels, and it really does. We've had players here in the top 50 in the world hitting and playing, and their ability to use the tools that are out there like competition and understand, even, even as players who have to win, they have to win, they have to make money, they still know that they can't win every time. And back to the competitive experience being about winning and losing, right? So um, I think it's very important to understand the tool of competition um, and, and continue to define that for ourselves. Technical goals, you know, so here we go down the rabbit hole for sure. I heard this attributed from Melanie Molitor. I can't say for sure she said it, but it's, it's really underpinned a lot of how I coach. Every shot from every spot with every spin. So if we add to that all of the athletic benchmarks that we need to hit for a young player, um, what a wonderful way to send a player off to college if we can really, you know, to teach every athletic skill possible from the earliest age in a fun, progressive environment, create challenge and opportunities for improvement, um, key, hit on the key windows, understand and assess. And, um, and, and the big one from our strength and conditioning coach who contributed to this slide, sports sampling and transition to early specialization needs to be understood by coaches and parents. When we're doing that, a lot of times our technical goals or technical skills are being taught for us, and then we're only refining. When they're not taught, when players specialize too early and things of that nature, we, we can tend to lose some of those skills and it's gonna make it a lot more difficult for us. And we've seen it at every level. We've seen players at the collegiate level with horrendous skills of various types. You're like, what happened? So they missed, they might've missed that. Doesn't mean we can't make it a little better, but if you were working with that young competitive player and, in, you know, my philosophy is that by the time we get them ready to go to college, I really want them to have everything possible ready to go. And now, is that possible? I don't know. But again, to be as proficient as possible there, if not, you know, at least competent. And um, finally, I, I believe we need to be the guides of self-discovery rather than the dictators of philosophies. And I have to really... Um, credit Ann Pankhurst and Brian Parkin and PTR talking a lot about that. We, we really got to quit dictating information and teach players to self teach. Um, and there are others. So um, that's a big one. I think when we're teaching technical or any kind of goal, tactical goals, learning to compete. So again, we're back to the art of coaching you know, you're continuing education, your, your anecdotal um, reminders of your, how you grew up and, and, and uh, personal experiences, right? Uh, there's so many pieces here of problem solving, how you grew up. Um, did you play street basketball and, and have to figure things out for yourself or were you always taught? Often we're overtaught and, and maybe the argument could be made these days. A lot of players are more overparented than, than maybe my generation was, but I've heard my generation complaining nonstop about that next generation. So I feel a little like my dad's generation, but to be fair, the more we guide back to that guiding piece, um, the better the players are learning to compete. And an early age, you know, once again, taught through game sampling and variety. Uh, game variety is still valuable at older ages. I remember um, uh, Coach Smith at USC saying they played uh, ultimate Frisbee all, uh, quite often before practice and how much fun it was for them. And, you know, you're still developing. You're, st you're always developing, right? So what's happening on my side of the court? What's happening on the other side? What decisions should I make? What are the decisions I should make? Um, those are tactical goals. Those are fundamental problem solving and self-discovery tools. Um, 
tennis specific competition again. Now we're getting into the fundamentals of tactical development. Um, what are the game styles? And are you teaching that game? So one of your eight weeks, six weeks, four weeks, whatever you want to be inside of a curriculum, maybe you're using it, maybe you're not. But I think everybody spent time on serving and volleying. Do you, do you spend time as an aggressive baseliner and understanding how that player plays? Introduction into patterns. Once again, one of my favorite places to be. I love pattern development and personal style. As a player gets older, um, you know, they, they may drift more towards a personal game style or, or um, could be an all-court player. Uh, so those patterns are going to be dictated by the type of player they are. I think Bill Belichick, some, something along the lines of the less variety you have, the better you, the, the more you need to be great at whatever it is you do. It's a poor paraphrase, but so accurate. Um, so again, as, as, as a fundamental coach, as a competitive experience coach, somebody who's trying to get players to the next level, whatever that level is, we're delivering this fundamental base of patterning, uh, the game styles, sampling different things, self-discovery. And then at some point we start developing weapons and, and, you know, I'll say for the too many times, this is the fun part of coaching, collaborating with other coaches. What are you working on? What are your tactical goals? What is happening in, in this academy or that academy? How do I improve? Physical goals, this is where it, gets, it can, I think this gets a little difficult. And I feel like I have a, a quality background in some physical sciences. I've done the second level of the ITPA and working on my master of that. But when I talk to my strength and conditioning coach or Dr. Nira Gianthi, um, Dr. Mark Kovacs, you realize how little you really know. So trying hard to understand developmental ages, understanding growth development and maturation fundamentals of quality and strength and conditioning. Um, all, everything in this slide for me is, is very, very important. Um, that it really allows us at every level of the game to set up the right working environment, the right workout environment, the right loads, um, understanding the pressures that they're under and, and what, they can, what they can handle. Um, for example, an 18 year old playing a national level tournament has an enormously different physical need than a 12 year old girl playing a state level tournament. Or conversely, you could have a 12 year old girl, 12 year old boy playing in a national event and going really deep and being there for a long week. And then that's a lot of physical mental load. So preparing them for that and understanding how we prepare on a weekly basis in the programming. Um, and, and it could be to, to regress it from there, even a player who's playing league tennis for the first year ever and their team makes it to the nationals. So they're flying on a plane and they're with their team and it's exciting and they're in school. That's a lot going on and they're growing. They're likely growing like crazy. So understanding, you know, puberty, PHV, other, you know, growth development, maturation impacts and benchmarks. It's huge. Um, collegiate professional level may have experienced some physical opportunities, some missed physical opportunities for the skill acquisition, the physical skill acquisition. This may be due to early specialization or other factors, but these issues can still be assessed and improved, therefore possibly preventing future injuries and hopefully having a positive impact on performance. Again, same thing I said before, we have seen players who don't run well at all and they're playing in the top 700 in the world. Don't stop well, have poor single leg strength, don't throw well, you name it, they're all out there. And there's some that are perfect. It's like, gosh, it's like almost a perfect athlete. And, and so everything under the sun, you know, that, that we're going to see, it's just at each of the levels we're coaching at, each of the developmental levels, to be, have some ground base of the physical demands and needs that we need to bring to the table uh, weekly, daily, monthly, annually. So not only are there different demands, there are also de different developmental goals. I think that's pretty obvious. Mental goals. Um, gosh, we've, we've certainly seen enough videos and, and listened to all of the experts on these, and there's so many, and it's a, another huge um, hole to go down and, and fun to talk about. I love beating these things up, too. I do believe if, if you're defining the goals, the expectations, the roles, who's owning things, and putting together a player development plan, um, I think you're going to take some of that stress off the player. I, people, I don't think players, coaches, or parents like to feel like we're winging it. Um, so defining the roles from the beginning and setting up expectations and roles with a healthy young player deal with a variety of stresses that come with being a student athlete. Um, also, this is important to me and I did learn it. Um, I'm going to forget is Eric Buterak on a Ted talk he did. And I wish I could remember the name of the Ted talks. I, I should um, quote him here, but 
he talked as a player that he really needed to set daily goals. Young players and, and players, all these young players are over-talked on. Oh, I thought you were going to play college tennis. Why aren't you doing this? I thought you wanted to make the high school team. Why aren't you doing this? I personally believe through experience and, and through relationships with other great coaches that if we can keep these talking points to, hey, what are we doing today? What's going on today? What are we getting ready for this weekend, maybe? Keep things on a shorter term. Uh, the, the longer term stuff just gets over talked and, and just becomes nonsense to, to younger players, even players in college, pros. It's just sometimes it's too big a model. I'm, I'm a thousand in the world. I want to be 200. That's just too far away. Um, I just began a, an intense training program at an academy, but I'm still relatively new at competing. And my mom wants me to think about college tennis. Okay, it's out there, but what are we going to do today? What are we going to do tomorrow? I think it's a lot easier. Um, so the rituals and habits can be created, assessed, and evaluated through having an understanding of each day's goals. That's going to make our life a lot easier. I think it's going to make things a little cleaner. Assessments and planning. We've been through a lot of, many of us have been through a lot of planning protocols and how to test and do assessments. These can be super complicated or these can be really, really simple, tend to move on the side of simple as much as possible. Often we don't need massive assessments. We know that a young person in, in PHV growing really fast is probably not going to do a great single leg squat. So we know they're going to need some hip stability and TFL work, things like that. Um, Short-term planning versus the long-term. You do have to plan for the long-term. I think it's something you put out there. So depending on which model you want to use, um, Maybe you're just doing a two-year goal. Maybe you're doing a five. Um, periodization, I'm a big believer in trying to do it. You know, it's, for me, it's, a, it's certainly a theory, and it works. I know it works. I feel like it's worked for us, but I don't feel like I'm any sort of expert in it. I'm just trying to create a better model every year. My eight-week model is the one we're using now. Um, working with our staff and planning, understanding how we're using competition, again, as an assessment or a planning tool, uh, using training blocks. Um, these, you know, this is a really fun rabbit hole too. Uh, we've gone down this with ITPA numerous times and PTR use PTA. I think USTA high performance. I think everybody's trying to get these numbers just right. I had asked Riley Oka's strength and conditioning coach, what happened the year he won junior Wimbledon? And he said, Riley got hurt. And we ended up with like a three or four week window to train. I was like, Oh, that's funny. He goes, you know, because he's a teenager and just trying to get him at that time to, to do all the right training. Clearly, they did a great job with him. So assessments and planning, I'd, I'd say keep them simple as much as you can. And again, strength and conditioning coach will help you so much. Uh, watch out for the stress. Know when to back off and know when to push. We're trying to keep kids healthy and in the game. Here's an assessment. A young man went to college a year later. Um, once again, he's growing. We'll play that one more time. Oh, it went backwards. Let's see if we can get back to that. Um, that's not a great not. single knee there, right? So, but we, we knew it's that not. ahead of time. And as a result, we put him on a good program and, and he, he did great. And he's having a great, uh, I think he's a junior in college. Here's a complex um, periodization model I used for one of my players. Um, you see lots of words, lots of dates, lots of comp times. Anybody in, in you know, high performance probably using some of these, but I, I really have gotten away from this model a lot and use a lot more simple model. Now, look, it looks great. Uh, I'll be frank, I think parents really like to see this kind of prep work done for their kids. And I enjoy doing it. But the problem is I always end up changing this about three months in, because uh, they're, they're not meeting something or, or they're getting past a goal. So I'm going to a shorter um, model with three months or four months out. And, uh, and here I did, this is actually six months, so this one wasn't too bad. And I said to reassess, and actually, we do need to reassess that player's moving along, uh, moving along nicely. Um, here's, a, here's a shorter one. I like this one better. I think it's simple. It's easy to get through. Um, players can understand it. You just, we, we do want to tie these models into the competition base. Um, again, this is the competitive experience. These things don't have to be complicated. Um, the younger the age, the simpler and the older 
the more purposeful too. Uh, you know, there's so many ways to do this. It's just, I think it must take a lifetime to do them right. And I, I've got a lot to learn about this, but trying very hard to get it out there correctly each year. I've been writing them for a number of years. And, and frankly, I reach out to coaches all the time to find out what they're doing with this. Um, and, and it helps a lot. I ask a lot of questions. I never think I have it right. Collaboration, that's a good segue. That was accidental too. Coach Bruce on the left, Emilio in the center. I'm back there, all uh, unshaved as usual. Coach Nestor, one of the great coaches. Jake, players here. This is Orange Bowl. Um, we were stuck in the rain. I think it was 2016, maybe 15. In Miami, it wouldn't stop raining. I called Emilio Sanchez. I can't say any. I can't say high enough things about that coach and that and him as a person and his program down there. Um, Jake was training there some, and and I called him. I said, "Gosh, we have no problem driving the hour and a half across if you can give us some courts because we've got all these kids stuck in in the rooms." And and he's like, "Absolutely!" And they welcomed us and came out and visited with us, and we hit balls and we all talked as coaches. Um, this is why I coach. I mean, these are smiles. Some of these guys have never seen an alligator in their life. This is the competitive experience. Now, this is a pretty good group of kids. I mean, it's a pretty elite crew. But still, whether it's a, a young beginner crew or a, a really advanced crew like this, what, an, what a remarkable experience for them. And, and I'll certainly never forget it. And there's some great coaches in that picture. Our professionals that we use in the business, this is, we've seen a big change. And big thank you to USTA for pushing things forward and huge thank you to PTR and USPTA for learning how we need to collaborate together. And I think that's getting better every year. We must be certified, background checked and educated. We must have some playing levels, but if we don't have playing levels, we need to hire coaches who are from these environments and use them, uh, or at least use them for some consulting. Uh, leadership, I believe the leadership back to the beginning of, of our presentation was having a mission, goals, and integrity. Um, integrity is a big one. We ask that question a thousand times a year here. Kids are going to throw rocks at me the next time I ask them what the definition of integrity means. Coach, the player relationship and needs, they really have to be in tune. Um, strength and conditioning side, again, highest possible level is going to give you the best program. That's where I really put in our time and loving what they're, where they're doing for us because we're athletes and human beings first before we're tennis players. Continuing education, I've spoken about that a number of times. Um, you know, and collaboration is just really big. Collaborating and asking questions. I ask my staff all the time. I never feel like I know everything. Um, successful competition programs need an organized leader, blah, blah, blah. Coaches should not feel as if they're competing with one another. I, that's a big one for me. And I'm going to try to wrap up here and get to questions right away. I, I've been to programs where the coaches are all nervous that somebody else is going to take their player and things like that. I mean, that, that's collaboration is the key in, in humility for us, for our program. I think it's, it's massive and creating that culture and in that environment within your program is part of your mission statement. Coaches who can call on their personal experience of the junior collegiate and professional pathways. Um, these players are integral to a higher level program, especially, um, but they're, they're integral to any level. But having them around has helped me tremendously. Uh, I played at an okay level. Uh, it was a division one junior college, <laughs> you know, hope, hope springs eternal. But uh, having these players on staff with us allows me to validate myself. But if, even if you don't, they're always just a phone call away all over the country. Um, not to mention the USTA HP program and, and how incredible they've been for phone calls and, and collaboration there. Um, I've never met a great coach who claimed to know everything. And I've met some really amazing coaches and often they surprise me. I was like, oh, I didn't know that was that coach. And wow, just humble and open and, and can't, get, can't get enough information. So I've beat that up enough, I suppose. So we need to have the best possible coaches available all over the United States in every single program. And we need to learn to work together. It's, it's, it's imperative. Our staff, uh, group workouts. We're doing a little group workout lately. That's Greer on the left. She played at Presbyterian College. Austin Smith played at Georgia. Jordan Cox introduced him earlier. Miss Salif Kante on here, All-American at uh, FAMU. Um, really wish we could find more female coaches. It's been a tough one. I'm talking to them all the time, but um, they're just not enough in our business, guys. So that's a really important piece. Um, you know, Greer's relationship is spent not just to my males, She's, she straightens them up from time to time for various things they say and do, but also that 
situation with other female players. Sometimes I might not understand something the way Greer understands it. And, and she is, um, she's made me a better coach and a better person every day. Uh, so, you know, trying to find the best staff again is uh, integral. There's a character for you. Mr. Austin Smith, uh, he just came off tour with Bethany. He is traveling as a traveling pro with us. He bounces around, but kids love him. He's, this is him. This is what he does. He makes me laugh, makes them laugh. Then he's yelling at them. Same with Jordan. It's, it's, uh, it's fun. And I hope everybody has that kind of experience. And, and thank you. Thank you. This is my family. And um, I really appreciate your time. So with that, um, I, I know I want to take some, some questions. And I have to figure out how to do that. Okay, no open questions yet. Okay. So, so Jim, you can keep you can keep the screen just like this. Um, okay. We don't have any questions yet, but but obviously we 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 definitely would, would love to have some. But I'd like to kick off with a question of my own, um, and then hopefully we can get some people uh, putting in some stuff in the Q and A. Um, we had some people in the chats uh, really like the quote that we need to be guides of self discovery rather than dictators of philosophies, and I I really think that that plays a lot into what the USTA is looking to do with the uh, American development model and uh, being in line with multi-sport participation and all that stuff. So it's, it's really great to hear you say something uh, along the lines of that. But I wanted to give you a question. Um, how, do you, how do we implement um, self-discovery to, to kids at a young age? Um, do you, are there some specific things that, that you uh, try to encourage the kids to do? or maybe get the parents involved, maybe don't have the parents involved as much. What, what are some things to, to encourage self-discovery, um, especially for your, like, your junior players at a young age? Yeah, it's um, often setting up problems um, and uh, asking questions, but setting up problems, you know, it's, it's like, a, like a math teacher. You put the problem out there and, and let them figure it out and, and guide them as they go. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the big one. You know, if it's uh, hitting them a high ball, maybe you're feeding the, the, the point in and you, you chunk them a high ball and it bounces over their head and um, you chunk them another one. And at some point, whether you ask them a question or not, um, they, they're, they're going to either figure it out or ask you a question. And that opens up the, the collaboration and the talking. And, you know, it's kind of the art of the coaching then. What, what are you going to do to, to fix that? How are you going to how are you going to make that? Uh, work for you that ball's bouncing over your head where you're going to keep letting it bounce. you know what we're we going to do and then leading them to some skill acquisition there but the the fun and the art I think of coaching is um can how, how much fun can we have with that question you just asked how many things could we come up with that would set up problems hey he's really been fantastic with it has been Johnny Parks at, at USTA and I know he's moving on to another position now and Bruce Houghton as well is always talking about that two really great coaches from there and and they're always looking at ways to create self-discovery and problem solving. So to, to solve a problem, we've got to have a problem, I guess is the short answer. And just have fun doing it. Just really enjoy that, um, that kind of thing. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I know that. That's, that's awesome. Um, Renee, would you like to take over and, and uh, read sure. off Renee's? Sure. Um, we have some questions. Uh, Brian is asking, do you feel the shortening of sets, matches, and competition is good, bad? Depends on the situation. For example, short set scoring. Yeah, it's a super question, Brian. I, I know, and gosh knows, I've sat through more short sets in my last two years than I, we never had a short set in my life. We never even played anything but three sets. So uh, the game changes. I do believe it's the crying over spilled milk thing a little bit though. We really need to make the best of situations for our players. Um, if playing short sets can be debated all day, but um, I think I said one time a really good coach could use a stick and a rock and teach a player how to play tennis. I don't know if that's true or not, but if, if competition is a tool and we're talking about junior development, then the short set is just another tool. And our role, our, um, our relationship as a coach to the player and to the game, if we view that as a problem, an issue, then the player views it as a problem and an issue. And maybe viewing it as an opportunity um, might be the better way to do it. And I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to believe in that myself. I haven't, I've, I've had plenty of frustration with, Oh, if, if this was just a longer, you know, match, but at the end of the day, I think we have to take whatever's given to us and make the best of it. Um, and that, that shows a good example to our players as well. I hope that answers that question. Yep. 
And another one, is it bad to have your players playing each other too much? Yeah, that's, an, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, is it bad to have them playing each other too much? You know, social interactions, um, you go back to, I guess, some of my background in understanding different stages of development. I think at young ages, there's peer group and social interaction going on there. And if one player is beating up on another player all the time, um, that, that could be negative. You know, young players really need to be winning some matches and they need a variety of social en engagements and peer group engagements. And um, I think the difference between guys and girls, that maybe there's some different social hierarchies there and how they view it, uh, whether it's male or female or, or whether it's maybe um, just where they're coming from socially. Uh, I, I think it's, I don't know that there's one direct answer to that but I would be extremely cognizant of results and feelings and emotions having to decide, is this an opportunity for self growth or are we just doing a little too much self growth? We're playing each other that much because they're drilling with each other every day. So if, if we're talking about playing matches, um, I'm a, I'm a believer in variety. So I think the more variety you can create and the more opportunities, um, the better. Okay. Uh, how do you monetize all your extra off-court work, such as setting up the periodization map and making modifications? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> Business side, I love it. Um, okay, so started off with one model, 23 models later. You know, we try to factor in the cost of our program as, as a really good program. We, we hope it's a good program, and then we cost it. Uh, like that. I, I factor in admin time. The way we do it here at Harp Tennis is if you're a player that is with us four days a week, you're fully committed to four day a week training, then your periodization model is part of your uh, cost. You don't pay extra for it. If you're not on the four day, if you're not all in and, you know, at, our, at our top level, then that periodization model, I charge $250 for um, to, to write a plan. And I have no problem. That includes a meeting as well. So I, I guess I, the answer for that would be, you know, you don't ever want to feel like you're doing anything for free, but the more important um, thought is, is am I, am I value is what I'm doing a value. Sorry, I was lost for words mm -hmm. there. Um, I want to have value. So I want my player to have value. I want the family to feel value that I'm working hard for the player. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. At what age should a tennis player specialize if they want to play D1? And would it be different between boys and girls? I think it is different. When we talk about age and stage, and I, I really didn't put it in the slides, um, we're actually talking about stages of development. So the chrono chronological age isn't going to be super helpful to us, but the developmental age. Um, I remember a... Uh, report coming from USTA that said virtually all of our Olympic athletes were multi-sport athletes through um, through high school even. But I would say somewhere in that eighth grade, ninth grade-ish kind of year, depending on where they're at in strength and conditioning and, and physicality and growth and development, there's got to be some specialization beginning uh, to create um, some repetition within the skill sets. Um, and, you know, division one often isn't as it's not just a product of hard work and specialization, but there, there may be some DNA contributions there as well. You got to be probably have to be one heck of an athlete and a very hard worker to make that level. But I, I don't we have to be we have to have that understanding of growth development and maturation to make that. And then we want that sport sampling to have gone on. For me, it's somewhere in that 13 to 15 years old depending on the level of the athlete and the quality of the skills. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more. I find that some juniors have been taught power before consistency, accuracy, spins, and hitting on the rise. And it's very difficult for them to go backwards, as they would say. Wow. Any that's... suggestions to help yeah, this along? This is, a, this is a great question. This is a really great question. And, and the reason I say it is power output is a really big part of, of playing tennis. Um, our ability to use power, to use hip extension, to use kinetic chain. Um, I'm a big advocate of creating power early and being very careful of creating 
uh, swing shape too early. Uh, hopefully we can create the proper biomechanical movements early and that's as high of output as possible that that player can create. So jumping in the air for a balloon, trying to jump higher than other people. So the, the, for me, the power output is not just taught on the tennis court. In fact, most of it's created um, in the sports sampling and in the physical side of the you know, strength and conditioning. I, if, if, you're, if you've got a player who hits very, very hard and the ball is going outward, you, you may have a swing shape issue. You, you may have a balance issue and they're, they're going to be one, you know, you have to take those one at a time and it can be difficult, but I certainly understand. I think doing the assessment, taking videos and finding the disease and not looking at the symptom is going to be the real, that's going to be the real uh, firecracker in that is yes. Okay. You hit with good power. That's awesome. We certainly love power, but you're not able to create spin. So why am I not creating spin? Is the player not dropping the arm and instead dropping the wrist? Or maybe they're dropping the wrist, creating too much spin, and they're using the wrist. So it's let's make sure that we're looking at the disease. So is the disease I'm not sitting low and using the lower half of my body well to get under the ball? Or is the shape of the swing hitchy and too busy? There's, there's a lot. You know, it's another rabbit hole easily to go down. But I think this is where the use of video sometimes can be really helpful, where you break it down and and find the actual culprit because likely power is not the problem power is not causing you to miss and, and not be accurate but maybe something was missed along that coaching line and and or or prior to coaching it could have happened younger uh may, maybe the way the player sees the ball i know we're running out of time but one thought is this we had a discussion here of the way nadal hits the ball and sees the ball versus the way roger federer or or serena williams uh, hits the ball and sees the ball. So two of these players like to see the ball on the way up and Federer, in other words, they hit upward on the ball a lot. Well, Roger Federer hits the ball a lot more linear. Not that, not that both of the others can't do that. Different ball striking, different ways of viewing the shot. So I think it's important to stay really athlete centered when you're looking at that. That situation's awesome. I love that you asked that question, Alejandro. That's, that's a really good one. I hope I answered it. I'm not sure. I think I painted around that a lot. That's all the questions we have. I'm looking in the chat. Um, I th think that's all we have. Yeah, I think, I think we're good, Renee. Um, yeah. yeah they were, thank you everybody for, for the questions. Those were fantastic. Yeah. And Jim, that was a, uh, that, that was a great, great presentation there. Um, there's so much, so much to unpack there. And it's just, uh, it's, it's one of those things that kind of gets you, thinking a lot more of how you can grow as a coach and, and, and grow as somebody who, who's working with, with kids. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, uh, just we, we, Jim, we, we thank you so much. Um, with that, we'll, we'll adjourn for, uh, for the day. And uh, actually we have another one coming up in, a, in about an hour with uh, the serve tennis uh, platform and uh, how you help uh, pros can use it uh, going forward with the new software and stuff coming out with the USTA. So, um, but, uh, but with that being said, Jim, uh, can't thank you enough. This was, Awesome, and uh, we really, uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to to give us a presentation on uh, creating a competitive experience. Guys, thank you so much. Thanks, USTA Middle States. You guys are awesome. Hopefully, we'll see you at one of these big tournaments when they come back. Guys, stay safe. All right, you Thanks. too. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.